in addition to taking care of patients during routine, uneventful surgeries, anesthesiologists are also trained to deal with rare but life-threatening events like an intraoperative cardiac arrest or even a fire that occurs in the patient's airway. But how do you get trained to handle something that happens so rarely? In this video, I explain how anesthesiologists receive training for emergencies that are so rare that they may never come up in a person's entire career. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive in. My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident and was selected this year to be a chief resident of teaching at the Mount Sinai Hospital's Department of Anesthesiology. We do spend a lot of time training residents on how to deal with situations that come up exceedingly rarely. Examples of these types of situations include power outages, gas supply failures, anaphylaxis, intraoperative cardiac arrest, malignant hyperthermia, and the list goes on. But suffice it to say, there are a lot of things that could potentially go wrong in the operating room, but fortunately are very rare. Despite how rare those events are, it's extremely important for anesthesiologists to be able to quickly respond with the appropriate steps to address any one of these situations that I mentioned. The severity of the situations I'm describing, as well as how rare they are, is probably why anesthesiology has earned itself the motto of 98% boredom and 2% sheer terror. Although I would argue that any anesthesiologist who is well trained wouldn't find themselves filled with terror in a situation where they can rely on their training and instincts to be able to respond to any emergency that comes up in the operating room. Learning how to deal with these types of situations is probably also part of the reason why anesthesiology residency in the United States is a four-year training program that comes after having completed four years of medical school. In my opinion, the most important way to establish a foundational understanding of anesthesiology, and particularly the kinds of clinical emergencies that I'm talking about, is simply by reading. For example, in my favorite textbook by Morgan and McHale, there's an entire chapter dedicated to complications in the operating room. But the best way to bring these situations to life without bringing them to your patient's life is getting into a simulation lab just like this one. The simulation labs at Mount Sinai Hospital's Department of Anesthesiology are only part simulation because the anesthesia machine that's behind me is a real anesthesia machine and is actually connected to gases that are in a room right next door. So it runs oxygen through the machine as well as carbon dioxide. So when I'm looking at a patient's in tidal CO2, it's actually CO2 that the machine is picking up. Moreover, the room is actually stocked with an anesthesia cart that includes all of the things that can be found inside of an operating room. Not to mention a host of airway equipment like video laryngoscopy and fiber optic intubating equipment and things like defibrillators, which we routinely use in simulation to go over advanced cardiovascular life support. Of course, the mannequin can be intubated to get more experience with airway procedures, but I think the most value from this simulator comes from when you step behind the console and see how it actually runs. Of course, you can control basic components of a patient's physiology like heart rate. For example, if I increase the heart rate like this, that tachycardia is enough to induce tachycardia in a junior resident who's just starting their first simulation. But if you really want to make things more exciting and educational, of course, for the participants in the simulation, you could throw on a more interesting cardiac rhythm like, I don't know, ventricular tachycardia. Your imagination is basically the limit when it comes to running a simulation like this where you can control every aspect of a patient's physiology and simulate just about anything that could come up in an operating room. And beyond all the controls of a patient's physiology, we can even do things like simulate fog. For example, you can check out this video that I linked right here where I simulate an airway fire and talk through how you would deal with it. The simulation device is so high fidelity that it actually has tear ducts so we can simulate, for example, a very emotional patient who's crying while awake or a circumstance like intraoperative awareness while a patient is paralyzed, which to be clear is an extremely rare circumstance, but we can simulate that here so that residents get an idea of how exactly that presents and then how to manage it. At the Mount Sinai Hospital Department of Anesthesiology, new residents undergo extensive simulation training at the beginning of residency. That includes two simulations per week for 10 weeks as part of an introductory boot camp. 
Then additional simulations are interspersed throughout the rest of residency. These simulations are run by the Chief Residents of Teaching, a group that I'm honored to be a part of, as well as residents who are part of the Clinical Educator Track, which is a special track that's available for residents at Mount Sinai's Department of Anesthesiology. For those interested in education, these are great ways to get hands-on experience teaching other people while still undergoing your training in residency. The Teaching Chiefs and Clinical Educator Track residents are also involved with putting on lectures and workshops on a variety of topics outside of the simulation lab as well. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video where I use the simulation lab to explain exactly how I handled an actual power outage situation in an operating room when I was rotating through a different hospital. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.